Alright, so we got prioritized here. Um, so before I get started, um, uh, Brent told me to say this. Um, we don't have any money. <laughs> like everything that you see was done without any money. And um, we would love to have money, but it would be like great if it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like that's what it would take to, you know, hire postdocs and or buy me out of teaching or something like that. <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, this is what you can do with nothing. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to uh, really, you know, kind of be sure to say up front before, because I'll probably never get to my acknowledgments, right? is uh, to thank Dick Moe, who um, was the IT guy at the uh, Jepson Herbarium for a long time, and he's the one who really has made it so that all this stuff goes up on the web. And, uh, <clears throat> and he didn't want to be an author, I think he's trying to retire, um, and, uh, but uh, he really should be an author, um, given his contribution. Okay, so um, we've started this California moss eflora, which parallels the Jepson eflora for vascular plants. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so this is what it looks like, which of course you can't read. Um, and then there's the URL, if you're you know, kind of trying to follow along. Um, you can go to this URL and then you can bookmark it, and then from there on out you can always get back to the California moss eflora. I always look at it on an iPad because I don't want like dirt pouring into my computer. But I have a like, dedicated iPad for looking at the flora while I'm keying out that stuff. And we start really with um, the Madronio keys of Norris and Shelock. So those were all brought in, and that's the starting point. Everything else uh, is developed uh, after that. Uh, and so there's then these uh, key to keys, or if you already know the genus that you're in, you can go uh, to that um, and then go key from the genus. So there's, a, there's sort of what a generic page would look like, a genus page would look like. Here's a close up. I'm really working hard at uh, trying to get an image for every uh, genus, which I think would be a nice thing and allow people to you know, kind of make sure that they're on the right track. And then I also might get the Hollywood Squares thing going, where we have all a bunch of genera, and then you can kind of click on one, try that one out. If that doesn't work, you click on another one. That doesn't work. Um, so the keys are pretty technical, but hopefully these uh, images will eventually make it so that you can kind of learn how to use the keys, and also you can bypass the keys uh, if necessary. Uh, then you get to a species page, and there's lots and lots of links from the species page. It goes to Google to bring up all other images of that species. There's also a link to the nomenclature. There's all sorts of stuff there. Um, and then at the bottom, there's uh, a Google map that shows the specimen occurrences. And then I really love these graphs where they have latitude here and elevation here. Kind of gives you a little idea of like what the niche of the species is in a very crude way. And then Arlie's pictures uh, are up here for a lot of things. <coughs> um, now, the map that I just showed you, that was based on an early data set. That's all going to get trashed very soon. And we're going to substitute the data set that comes from this, the Consortium of North American Bryophyte Herbaria. And um, most of the large public Bryophyte Herbaria North America have now scanned in all of their labels. And all those labels have gotten it, gone into a database, so there's this huge, great database of label information. Um, and uh, I'll just click through a little bit of it. If you go uh, to make a map from the consortium, then you get this map that's in Google, which looks a little bit better than the old map that we had. And you can see this specimen up here is pretty suspect. Like, I would, I would go check that out. That's incredible if it's true. <laughs> and there's, you know, abundance of such points that should be uh, worked on. So the, the daunting thing, the thing that we need the hundreds of thousands of dollars for would be to verify the herbarium specimens. Like, we're pretty good at looking at the labels, 
Unfortunately, the labels reflect what somebody thought when they didn't have the literature we currently have, usually when they were bringing in a bunch of specimens from a place of all different genera, not looking at, let's say, all of their orthotrichums at one time. Uh, and so it's very spotty. You know, we really have no idea what the reliability of an individual data point is. And so what we're hoping to do is as time goes on, if we got 30 of you, 30 bryologists, 30 would-be experts to take on this genera, genus or that genus uh, and uh, annotate all of those specimens and fix up the key and, and so on, uh, then we would have author annotated data points that would be a different color or something like that. That would be, that would be super cool. Uh, anyway, um, so now uh, Nikti, my student here, stand up Nikti. <laughs> If you have any questions or comments, you can talk to her during lunch. Um, she's uh, working on a prototype of this, uh, key to our in California. And uh, if the IT stuff works here, I should be able to click on that and it'll take me to the real thing. So this is live. Uh, and what Nikki's doing is she's taking pictures of all of the characters that are associated with each couplet. Um, so that you can really see, like what we're talking about, what do we mean when a plant is uh, crispate or has leaves that are erect? You know, like all moss leaves are erect, right? <laughs> it's just some are less erect than others. Uh, and so it's helpful to have the picture there and then you can you know, click on the next couplet and it keeps on going down here and it kind of tells you. Like one of the questions is always, you know, how bumpy are the leaves? Well, if you look closely enough, all moss leaves are bumpy. So it's like minutely bumpy versus really bumpy to a bryologist, which is hardly bumpy at all to a vascular <laughs> plant person. You know, like, uh, I think the images will help a lot. Even, you know, it does, they don't have to be great images. They don't have to be spectacular photographically. In fact, it's probably good if they're just the way that you would see them through your microscope, which is what we're doing. Um, okay, so then I kind of go back to this, I think. <clears throat> um, now, another thing that's happening is uh, over the past couple of years, we've gotten beyond just uh, inventorying rarity by sitting in a coffee shop. Now we have meetings and there's a process and uh, the CNPS inventory uh, has taken on dealing with bryophytes and it's quickly getting better and better, and there's a, there's a way in which you can get things off lists and put things on lists, and it's, a, it's just a lot more scientific. That's all gonna be uh, hooked up and dovetailed with the California moss e-flora. Uh, oh yeah, here's the money thing again. Um, so we need worker bees, and there's like 300 active authors for the Jepson e-flora. So we have about a tenth of the species, so we really only need like 30 authors. <laughs> and some of them, you know, could be the experts from Sweden or something and for a particular genus. Uh, but then there's other genera that we don't, either don't have an expert for or they're pretty, you know, doable. It's, it's handleable. It's not an impossible task. Uh, and uh, somebody who has a lot of time on their hands and is lonely and once <laughs> the company of some bryophytes. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I mean, you can imagine what could happen and it's not impossible. I mean, like, that's how the Jepson flora was written. Uh, okay, so then um, another thing that you could do is, if you like field trips, you could go uh, and try to recite rare plants, uh, you know, kind of like see where things actually occur that are purported to be there. Uh, and that's, that's a good thing for uh, people to start doing. And then uh, what everybody with a good camera could do is take photos and then make sure that you have data associated with the photos, like ideally a specimen. I, I, we, what we really basically want is a specimen with all the herbarium data that would go with a specimen that goes with the photo. And then put that up on Cal Photos and tell me about it. And then the next version of the eFlora, your photo might be featured. Um, all right, so that's for the worker bees, as Jim says. Uh, the things that, we, that you don't have to worry your little head about. 
is don't worry about the IT stuff. Like, I know it doesn't look great, but it will develop along with the Jepson E flora. Like, that, that, that end of things will just naturally develop. And then I also don't think that you really have to worry about the CNPS listing and delisting as a process. Now, you do have to worry about the quality of the data. You know, like, we need to know whether these things are for real. We need to get other, um, other uh, occurrences uh, in the database and stuff like that. But, um, you know, like, there are people in charge of taking care of, of the, the process of getting it in and out of the database and judging it. Um, okay, anyway, assuming that we have no real money, what else can you do? And uh, here's what I would suggest. There's four things. First, uh, learn a few mosses. Like, you can super up your naturalist mojo if you just learn <laughs> the mosses and lichens of the place that you go walking uh, every, every day. So people will be impressed. If they'll want to go out with you, you'll get dates. It's, it's, it's kind of nice. Um, and it's not that hard. You know, like, you can learn 20 mosses. Come on, you've learned hundreds of vascular plants. Um, okay, then the other thing is uh, teach a young person, let's say a person who's young of any age, teach them about how some species of mosses have boy and girl mosses and where sporophytes come from. I mean, like, this is basic information that people should know. We shouldn't be keeping the next generation from knowing the secrets of life. Um, so I, that's my charge, work on that, uh, and I'm doing my part. Um, and then the next thing you can do before February 1st is register for the spring foray. We got this great foray planned in the San Bernardino Mountains. Uh, if you don't know about it, just send me an email. That's the easiest way, and then I'll tell you to send me a check. And <laughs> the whole thing will be put in place. You don't have to know any bryophytes to go on the spring foray. We're always great at um, you know, providing the vendors with exercises to get them up to speed right away, and uh, so on. And then the other thing is, uh, what do they call this in, in the news? They call it chatter. Like, we want to start a lot of chatter about a CNPS bryophyte chapter. Uh, like, we need an organization and we think that the best way to do this organization is for us to be a chapter or something um, within CNPS that has officers and <laughs> rules and that propagates itself from year to year so that if uh, Brent wants to retire, the whole thing doesn't come crashing down. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of, I think this, we've got our best chance now, we're strong now, let's do it. Uh, so talk to your people about making that happen. Uh, okay, now, uh, I think I still have plenty of time, although you can cut me off anytime you want. Um, so I thought, okay, some people in the room don't know their bryophytes. So these are like six genera. They're, they're actually <coughs> exemplars. Brett would say it this way. They are exemplar specimens that are in six genera. Uh, that you just absolutely ought to know in order to be fully human. <laughs> so, of course, there's Orthotricum that Nikki works on, and uh, it has these calyptra that are very large. They almost completely cover the capsule, and they have often hairs on them, although not every species has hairs on them. Some of them are naked, and others are pubescent. Um, and uh, that's kind of an important thing to know. They grow on a whole bunch of different uh, types of substrates, but usually pretty hard substrates like rock or uh, tree trunks. And um, Orthotricum, I think, has the most endemic species of any moss genus in California. Uh, Centricia, yeah, you should know this one. Uh, but the leaves of Centricia, they're kind of like tongues. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> And a lot of the species have hair points on the tongues. Uh, and then if you get sporophytes, the sporophytes are rather tall and cylindrical, and then they have a, a very elongate cone at the top. If, there were, if the um, operculum were to pop off, then the, the peristome underneath it would be a kind of twisted turbinate. Uh, you know. So that's, that's all over the place. You should definitely know Centricia. In fact, maybe you should know Centricia princeps. Like you see a huge centricia with lots of sporophytes, there's like a 90% chance it's princeps, especially if it's kind of down low. 
Uh, and then everybody should know Bryam, probably Bryam argentium. Um, Bryam argentium is uh, one species in a huge group. Uh, and uh, it's all over the place, like cosmopolitan. And um, it, when it's dryish, the it's sort of bleached out. The, the the distal end of the leaves is is doesn't have much chlorophyll, so it's kind of bleached out. And then the leaf, the the capsules have this somewhat pear-shaped look. Like I don't know if you can see it here, but this part here that's not part of the urn of the capsule is a little bit smaller. Uh, that's the hypothesis. That will also up your mojo, like if you can use the word hypothesis. <laughs> uh, and then Grimia, everybody should know Grimia, sort of like uh, the Brothers Grimm. You can remember the name because it's the Brothers Grimm. And um, Grimia's, I don't know, like I just know them when I see them. <laughs> sometimes they have glassions and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the sporophytes are kind of hooked over. Um, and sometimes they're not, uh, but they're, they're usually kind of short and they, uh, they're kind of the classic thing that grows on rock when nothing else, no other mosses are there. They're almost a lichen. Chromius are almost a lichen. Uh, okay, uh, and then I call this one blonde huggies. <laughs> Homolithesium and, um, it branches all over the place. Uh, and we have a lot of nice, really nice homolithesiums in California. Like, I think it's a, it's a nice group to know. There's not a ton of species, but there's, you know, those species occupy great big uh, climatic zones uh, within California. And uh, they kind of creep around like this and then kind of have this braided look. So that's one I would definitely know if you're in California. Like if you don't know that, then there's something. If you don't want to, if you don't want to know that, there's something kind of weird about you. <laughs> okay, and then this one is kind of obscure, and maybe um, uh, maybe it's I, it shouldn't make the list of six, but uh, it's very recognizable. It's in streams or fountains, fontanalis, as in things that grow in fountains, uh, and. Um, they usually have uh, three ranked leaves. They're, they're usually pretty big mosses in really clean streams uh, in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, so I don't want to overwhelm you. That's just six. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there.